We are in John's Gospel, chapter 16, and we're going to begin reading in verse 7, and we will read down to verse 15, although we probably will go further than that this evening, but for reading purposes, and we're going to be thinking uh, about the wonderful Holy Spirit and his work uh, in this age. So verse 7, he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. And again, God will bless that short reading of his precious word to us this evening. We want to focus in this opening little segment, really, on a twofold aspect of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. First of all, his ministry to the world. And by that, I mean the world of the the unsaved, of lost sinners. And then we want to think about his ministry to the to the saint. So his ministry to the to the world and to the sinner and then his ministry to the saint. And uh, wonderful to know that uh, he is at work, the Holy Spirit, in our particular day. In this age of the spirit, he is very actively working both in the lives of sinner and saint alike. And what a blessing it is to know that he is indeed at work. And we, I think, uh, mentioned last time, verse seven that the Lord says, really, it's in your own best interest that I go away, because if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And again, they had somehow to realize that this was the best thing for them, was the Lord Jesus going back to the Father so that he could send this other comforter. And so he wants to show them how advantageous it's going to be. What role will this Holy Spirit play, this comforter just like him? Uh, what what kind of role will he have? How will it be so advantageous to them? And uh, we uh, mentioned last time that uh, one of the advantages uh, is that when the Lord Jesus was here, uh, it was hard for people to get close to him because everywhere he went, it seemed like he was surrounded by crowds of people. And so the, the, the possibility of intimacy was somewhat limited. Uh, even amongst the 12, uh, they were constantly sharing him with multiple uh, competitors who all wanted part of him. And yet the most wonderful thing is that uh, now the Holy Spirit lives in each of us and is able to make Christ personal and real to every one of our hearts, wherever we are at any moment in time. And so that in, in itself is a great blessing. Uh, but he wants to tell them that one of the things that the Holy Spirit is going to do Uh, is his work in the world and his work amongst the unsaved. He's already hinted at this aspect of his ministry. The end of chapter 15, it says in verse 26, when the comforter is come, whom I'll send to you from the father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeds from the father, he shall testify of me and ye also shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So he's already mentioned the fact that the Holy Spirit is going to have a a ministry of testifying of Christ in this world and also a ministry of enabling and assisting them uh, to bear witness of the Lord Jesus. So he's obviously going to be working in this realm of witness and testimony. And the reason I'm using those words witness and testimony is because really what we're looking at now, we're on legal ground. And what he's really talking about is the fact that the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to act like a prosecuting attorney, if you like. 
Uh, and so he says in verse eight, when he's come, he'll reprove the world of sin. And that word reprove is the idea of he will, he will tell the world its fault, okay, uh, to, to, to convict, to, to uh, admonish, to refute, to tell them their fault. So it's almost like he's going to put them in the dock and he's going to convict them of their serious crime and the terrible position they're in. And so he's going to have a commit convicting ministry uh, to the world. And he's going to do something that will reach the heart and conscience, conscience of human beings. And so when he's come, he's going to reprove the world of sin, convincing by proof of fault or error. That's the idea. So it's kind of like this legal idea of somebody's got you in the dock and is really kind of showing you uh, your state. And, and of course, there's there's a real need for that, isn't there? Uh, a man has to recognize that he is in a state of sin and perdition before he can accept the Savior uh, who can deliver him. And uh, it's a sick man that, that acknowledges his need of a physician. And so this ministry of the Holy Spirit is really a, a very much a convicting, a telling man his fault. And uh, uh, his work brings a person to uh, awaken their conscience, as it were, to their dilemma, their need. And, and at that point, uh, he then would show them uh, the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice the extent of this convicting work, because uh, it's amazing how certain people and certain theologies love to limit uh, the, the work of Christ on the cross uh, and they like to limit the work of the Holy Spirit, but you can't get that from Scripture. Uh, it, the Scripture is very different. Uh, it talks about Christ give him, gave himself a ransom for all, and the only thing that limits the atonement is man's unbelief. Uh, he, he gave himself a ransom for all, and now we notice the Spirit that he, when he comes into this world, he will convict the world. Notice that he'll convict the world. We cannot limit that. He will reprove the world of sin. And so uh, the extent of this convicting ministry uh, is, is the world. And it's in this context, it's the world of the ungodly. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, uh, it's to say all men, uh, we can't restrict this uh, in, or modify it in any way. We have to let the scripture say what it says. And so it clearly tells us that he has a role today in the world, and it is that of convicting men of sin. And uh, we don't want to in any way limit this or modify it. And so we might say this, that the Holy Spirit is the Lord's, if you like, agent or advocate down here. In his absence, the absence of the Lord Jesus, he is carrying on his work, fulfilling his will, and in the relationship to the world, he is representing Christ to the world, and he is showing them of their sin. And notice that he mentions here uh, sin, uh, verse 9, uh, righteousness, verse 10, judgment, verse 11. So three things in view here, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And we need to think through each of these uh, individually. What is it? What is, is, it, is it a specific sin that he is convicting the world of? Or, or is it just the fact that they are sinners? And it's always interesting in the word of God to pay attention, not just to words, but to pay attention to whether the words are plural or singular. And so I want you to notice here that it says in verse 8, when he has come, he'll reprove the world of sin, singular. And I want to suggest to you that there's a specific sin in view that the Holy Spirit wants to convict the world of. And of course, the Lord enlarges on that in verse eight, uh, oh, sorry, verse nine, of sin because they believe not on me. And so <laughs> it's the particular sin that he wants to drive home to the hearts of men is the fact that they have not, I mean, this is the world, the world of the unsaved, that they have not believed 
in the Lord Jesus. They have not believed in the only begotten Son of God. That is the particular sin he wants to convict men of. Now, there are we know that there are sinners in the plural sense of the word. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know that. But man in a state of sin needs to believe on the Lord Jesus or else he's forever lost. And that is the sin that he's particularly interested in. I want you to notice, for instance, uh, in John 3, we've already kind of seen this idea uh, conveyed to us. In John chapter 3, verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So what is it that's going to condemn men for all eternity? It's because they have not believed in the Lord Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, the only Savior. They're, they're sinners, and there's only one Savior. And if you don't believe in him, you're lost forever. You're, you're without hope. And so uh, the great sin of not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is what the Holy Spirit is interested in. Uh, <clears throat> convincing the world of this particular sin, the sin of unbelief, not believing in the Lord Jesus. Now, it's interesting how uh, when the word, word of God uses sin in the singular, again, it usually has one specific sin in view. And I want to think of another example. In the book of Hebrews, he talks about sin a lot in the singular in Hebrews. And I want to suggest to you that there's one particular sin in the epistle to Hebrews that the writer is bringing to their attention, just as he's moved by the Holy Spirit. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Make sure that's the right reference. Sorry, Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing also uh, we are compassed with so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and then notice this, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And again, singular specific sin is in view, I believe, in the epistle to the Hebrews. What is that singular specific sin? It's a sin of unbelief, right? That's the sin. That's the big sin in the epistle to the Hebrews. Chapter 11, faith, right? That's the whole message of faith. Uh, by faith, by faith, by faith. And the opposite of faith is unbelief. And so all the way through the epistle to the Hebrews, he's trying to convict them of one specific sin uh, that is in view, and that is the sin of unbelief. And so that's what the Holy Spirit is doing today, convicting men of sin because they believe not on me. That is the particular sin. And we, uh, as we bear witness, we need to drive that home to men. Yes, men are sinners, but the ultimate sin is not to believe in the Savior of sinners. That's what condemns men. That's what gets men lost for all eternity. Uh, it's that uh, refusal to believe in the only begotten Son of God. And so we need to show men there's only one Savior. Uh, there's only one way that a man can possibly be saved. And the great sin of this age is to not believe in the only begotten Son of God, not believe in the finished work of Christ. And so that's what the Holy Spirit's interested in, in doing this work, convicting the world of sin. And then notice, he says, and of righteousness. And it's not, again, in a general sense of, uh, you know, that men need to be righteous. Uh, again, he, he's very specific in explaining what he means about righteousness. And notice what he says here again, verse 10, it, where he expounds it of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. And so the, the righteousness that's in view that he's convicting the world of is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's his righteousness that the Holy Spirit is convincing men of. Their sin for not believing in him, his righteousness. Now, what is it about that? Well, uh, as you well know, that when the Lord Jesus was on earth, he was falsely accused. He was called a drunkard. He was called a blasphemer. 
uh, he was, it was said of him that he cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. In other words, that uh, his power was demonic. Uh, he, he was using uh, satanic power to do his work. And so there were so many accusations that he, he is a blasphemer. He's an apostate. He's an imposter. I mean, there was so much hurled at the Lord Jesus and so many accusations. And the basic idea was they felt that he was a sinner. And yet he says of righteousness, because I go to my father. And the idea is this, that the resurrection and ascension to glory of the Lord Jesus showed that his claims were true. If he was what they said he was, why would the father want him? <laughs> if, he, if he's all of those things, why would the father want him? But the fact is that what they were saying was a lie, and he wasn't any of those things that he was holy, he was righteous, he was perfect in every way. And the resurrection and ascension, in a sense, was a great affirmation of the father of the work of the son, that his claims were true. And so, the, the, and of course, the sending of the Holy Spirit would prove that he had ascended to the father, uh, that the, the spirit couldn't be sent until Jesus was glorified. And, and so in a very real sense, Righteousness is what the Holy Spirit wants to show, but it's not uh, human righteousness. It's the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. His resurrection and acceptance at the Father's right hand after his work of sin bearing was complete. God raised him from the dead, showing that he was indeed righteous in all his claims and everything that he did. In a sense, this was God's reversal of their verdict they pronounced him to be all wrong and god's resurrection and, and, and exaltation had pronounced him to be all right and so it was a sense that he overturned their decision they tried him and they condemned him and the lord uh, was, uh, the, the father raised him from the dead and received him up into glory reversing all of their decisions and showing that christ was righteous in every way he pronounced him to be right in fact it was those that condemned him that were the real criminals and the one that was condemned was perfectly righteous and so the holy spirit convicting the world of sin sin of not believing in the lord jesus of righteousness not not of human but of the righteousness of christ his claims were true Everything he said was the truth. He was the truth. And the father gave an almighty, a glorious amen to that. And then finally, he says of judgment. Often when this verse is quoted, it's misquoted. Often people say, and of judgment to come, because they get that confused with what Paul said when he spoke of righteousness and judgment to come. But here, don't say judgment to come, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. It's talking about a judgment that's already taken place. And so he's going to convict the world of judgment. And the question is this, how can we know for sure that unbelievers will one day be judged? Well, the answer is simple. The prince of this world, their, as it were, their ru ruler, Remember, the Lord says to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. If, if the, the, the prince of this world has already been judged, then his subjects, his citizens will also certainly experience judgment. And so what he's telling us very simply is this, that at the cross, the judgment already fell on Satan. He was defeated. He was judged at the cross. He was proved to be false at the cross. Now, let's just try and think about, because this is not an easy thing to comprehend. We've already kind of grappled with it a little bit, because in John 12, verse 31, uh, we'd already seen, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. In other words, he's going to lose his position. He's going to lose his power. He's going to lose his authority uh, as Christ 
drew near to the cross. Now is the prince of this world judged. And we've got to go back to Genesis uh, to understand the full significance of this. Look at Genesis chapter three, uh, what is often known as the proto-evangelicum, uh, the first gospel, uh, the first kind of mention, if you like, of the gospel after the fall of man. And it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. So he's speaking to the serpent at this point in time. And so I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Okay, that seed of the woman is going to be Christ and your seed, that's going to be those that are the children of the devil, so to speak, it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. And so certainly the serpent is going to inflict a bruise on the Lord Jesus. He'll bruise his heel. But on the other hand, the Lord Jesus, the seed of the woman, is going to inflict a wound on him. And it says, it shall bruise thy head. Of course, we think of head, we think of uh, authority, we think of, you know, headship and all this kind of stuff, direction, all the rest of it. It was the Lord Jesus at the cross is going to inflict a head wound much more serious than the heel wound that was given to the seed of the woman. And again, it takes us to the cross. Now, I want us to look at some scriptures that talk about what took place at the cross. And we don't fully understand all of it, but we can see enough from scripture to say that that was a, as it were, a fatal day for the enemy of our souls. Hebrews chapter two and verse 14. Hebrews two, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And so through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And so, again, it was a very fatal blow to the enemy, uh, in a sense, robbing him of his power. Uh, he had the power over death, in a sense, but he, his power is broken by the work of the Lord Jesus at the cross. Look at Colossians 2. Again, please, Colossians 2, as we just consider these references. Let's just back up um, in, to verse um, 13. You being dead in your sins... And the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And so what we can say is that judgment was passed upon the devil at the cross now it hasn't been fully executed but it's already been passed the day is coming and we can see from this point on the the pathway to the devil for the devil is is a downward spiral it's already begun defeat was won at the cross for the lord jesus he defeated the enemy and so satan's going to be kicked out of heaven he's going to be thrown into the abyss and ultimately, he's going to go down into the lake of fire. And so the, the judgment's already been passed. He's the loser. Christ is the victor. But the full enactment of it's going to happen in stages. Uh, again, just in different stages, uh, kicked out of heaven, no more access to God, middle of the tribulation period. He'll no longer be able to go in and accuse the brethren. He's going to be cast down to the earth. He knows his time is short. He's going to do all that he can. All his venom is going to be seen in that short period of time. But then uh, he, when the Lord comes back, he's going to throw him in the abyss. And he'll be in the abyss, the bottomless pit, for a thousand years. Chained, will not be able to deceive the nations anymore. And then he's loose for a little while to show that a thousand years of incarceration did nothing to reform him. He's the same old devil that comes out, just as malicious and wicked as ever. And then the Lord Jesus very swiftly will take him and throw him into the lake of fire 
where the beast and the false prophet are, and he will stay there forever and ever and ever. But all of those subsequent events, the victory took place at Calvary. The judgment upon the prince of this world took place at Calvary. And so what the Lord is saying is this, if the prince of this world has already been judged, then those that are associated with him, those that are the children of the devil, uh, those that are under the sway of the prince of the power of the air, they will share his fate. As it were, if the chief is judged, the rest will be judged. And so of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So we're thinking about the Holy Spirit's work to bring conviction so that every mouth will be stopped and all the world will be guilty before God, and particularly recognizing their guilt concerning not believing in the only begotten Son of God. I want us just to look for a moment to Acts chapter 2, where we see, in a measure, this being carried out, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And remember, in John 15, the comfort is going to come uh, and he's going to testify of me. You also shall bear witness. So this idea of working together in harmony, the saint and the Holy Spirit. And so we find Peter, this first sermon of the church age. I've just been speaking about this recently to saints in Malaysia. And uh, one of the things I said about this first sermon in the, in the church age, it was, it was a sermon given by a man who'd been gloriously restored. He'd failed but God had restored it. It was a sermon given by a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was a sermon that was full of scripture. It was a sermon that was full of Christ. It was a Christ exalting sermon. And it was a sermon that had with it a definite appeal to the hearers to do something. And I want you to notice just what happens uh, as this sermon comes to a climax. And uh, <clears throat> It would break in in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ, right? Convicting the world of righteousness, right? Well, isn't that exactly? You crucified him, but God showed him to be righteous. How did he do that? Well, he says, uh, God has made them. That Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, raising him from the dead, setting him at his own right hand, proving his claims to be true. Then notice their response. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And there's a, a glorious example of this convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit pricking them to the heart, convicting them of sin. <laughs> what sin? They've not believed in the only begotten Son of God and of righteousness, his righteous claims. Why? He, he's already uh, been made both Lord and Christ by resurrection uh, and his glorious ascension. He's Lord, proven to be Lord and Christ. And, and now they're under conviction. They're pricked in their heart. And as you read through Peter's sermon. It's again, just, it's the spirit of God pointing, pressing home these great truths of the importance of believing on the Lord Jesus, the importance of who he, he was, his, his perfection, his moral character, and that they got the judgment wrong, but God overruled their judgment and raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand. And then Peter applies this great truth. And again, the Holy Spirit work is not Peter's eloquence or that he's some uh, persuasive speaker it's the holy spirit speaking through peter convicting these men of sin and they say men and brethren what what shall we do and again what a wonderful thing to see uh, this very truth being acted out throughout the book of acts and again as you look at all the sermons in the book of acts we see the same thing uh, this power of the holy spirit to convict the world of sin so now he's moving from the Spirit's work in the world, and he wants to focus now the Spirit's ministry to the church and to the individual saint. And so he says in verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, 
but you cannot bear them now. And the Lord recognized that they had a limited capacity at this time to take everything in that he wanted to teach them. It's not that because of lack of love that he kept things from them. In fact, we saw in chapter 15, in verse 15, if you remember, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known to you. And so he's given them everything the Father, but he's got more that he wants to tell them, but he recognizes there's a limit to just how much they can take in. He recognizes there's a, there's a capacity issue. And so he, he didn't tell them everything all at once. And it's good, like for us, when we get saved, imagine the first day you get saved, the Lord dumped all the truth <laughs> that you've learned over the years on you in that first day. You'd be overwhelmed, right? How, how did the Lord reveal truth to you? Well, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, right? Over the years, you've got a bit here, a bit there. You know, it's based on our capacity to, to understand it. Now, again, we don't want to be too slow uh, and, and too kind of, uh, uh, kind of reluctant to give truth, because when you look at uh, Paul's ministry in Thessalonica, uh, if you read 1 Thessalonians, it's amazing how much doctrine that Paul taught them in just a few weeks, <laughs> incredible the amount of things he talked to them about. Talked to them about the rapture. Talked to them about things like election. He talked to them uh, uh, about holiness of life. I mean, just so many things were communicated very clearly in the Thessalonian epistle to young believers who had only been saved just a few weeks. So, on the one hand, we don't want to be too slow in communicating truth. And it's a tragedy that sometimes people can be saved for years and still, in a sense, be on the ABCs. <laughs> they never seem to have got out of the alphabet, really, never made much progress. And we need to make sure that there, there is proper progress. But on the other hand, we need to make sure that people are getting it and can take it in. And so that's what the Lord is aware of here. He's, he's aware of their limitation. Of what, and especially right now, because remember, they're going through an emotional roller coaster. And so, because of all the emotions of the moment, they recognize that they can't, they just can't take everything that he wants to teach them. And so, what is he going to do? Well, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. See, I'm going to send you another one just like me. And so just like me in the sense of, of the same nature as me, of the same kind of person and character as me, and with the same truth that I have. And so he is going to minister to you. And so the spirit of truth is come. He'll guide you into all truth. And so <laughs> Holy Spirit uh, is pictured here uh, as notice the language of it he will guide you into all truth it's actually the the language of a travel guide you know a, a travel guide takes a person on a journey and kind of leads them along and shows them the various things of interest and that's the, that's the language here and it's amazing the holy spirit is taking us on a journey through the truth of god and he's showing us things of significance and things of importance. And he's the, he's the great teacher. And so a leader conducting a traveler into an unknown country, that, of course, is the inspired word of God. And he's going to lead them into all truth. And what a wonderful thing it is to have the spirit of truth guiding us into all truth. Spirit of God, my teacher be showing the things of Christ to me. And how we need men who are taught by the Spirit of God. Remember, Harry Ironside, uh, in his great biography, talked about a brother that he met. And uh, he was just in awe of this man's knowledge of the Word of God. And Harry Ironside said to him, he said, where did you get all this teaching? Thinking he might say, well, I went to such and such a seminary or such and such a place. And the man said, I got this teaching on my knees 
on the dirt floor of our home back in Ireland. <laughs> and here was a man who was taught by the Spirit of God on his knees the great truths of Scripture. Oh, what a wonderful thing to have men that are spirit taught. And so what exactly is the meaning of this? Uh, really he says when the spirit of truth is come he'll guide you into all truth he shall not speak of himself whatever he shall hear that shall he speak he will show you things to come now we've already had some inclination of these truths about the spirit leading us into truth if you look back in chapter 14 verse 26 it says but the comforter which is the holy ghost whom the father will send in my name he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And at the time, if, if you remember, we talked about the Holy Spirit helping them to remember all the important things in the gospel accounts that we needed. Okay. In other words, um, bring all things to your remembrance. And we, you know, if, if you remember, I mentioned that sometimes. Here, we, you know, after the Q&A session, my wife will ask, well, did you have any good questions? And uh, I'll say, oh, yeah, there's some really good questions. She said, well, tell me some. And by the time this is over and I've got to see her, I forgot what the questions were, but I know they were good. But sometimes my ability to remember is somewhat limited. Well, the disciples had been through three and a half years of amazing events. They'd seen so much. They'd heard so much. How are they ever going to remember it all? And if it was based on their memory, we'd be in really serious trouble. But notice he, he doesn't say it's up to their memory. He tells us that the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Holy Spirit brought to their remembrance what Jesus had said to them. And that's why we can be sure that the Gospels are authentic accounts of the sayings and the works of Jesus, because the Holy Spirit was the one who guided them and brought to the remembrance of these men everything that he had said. Now look at chapter 16, our passage, verse 13. It says, Jesus said, I've got a lot more to say to you, but you can't handle it now. And so he says, when the spirit of truth has come, he'll guide you into all truth. So this is truth that Jesus hasn't previously told them, right? So the, the gospels, John 14, 26, he'll bring to remembrance things I've said to you. But here are things he wants to tell them, but they're not ready for it. And, and so the Holy Spirit is going to give them stuff that, that he would have told them, but he couldn't because they weren't able and so he'll guide you into all truth. Many believe this is a reference to the Spirit's inspiration of the writing of the epistles. The teachings of the Lord that he didn't give them in the upper room ministry. They were given, many of them by the Apostle Paul, by the risen glorified head of the church, the Lord Jesus, in glory, given to him. But nevertheless, he would guide them into all truth, the things that Jesus hadn't said to them yet. And then verse, uh, again, verse 13, and he says, he will show you things to come. And so this is the Spirit's guidance in the writing of the apocalypse. Okay, so we've got John 14, 26, his guidance in the Gospels. John 16, 13, part one, his guidance in the epistles. And here, John 16, 13, he'll show you things to come, his guidance in the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so the Holy Spirit is going to oversee their teaching program, revealing things that Christ wanted to show them. And so the spirit of truth will come. He'll guide you into all truth. And so that, there's that, that original meaning of it which was to them as the recipients of this message, how these men would be guided by the Holy Spirit in giving us our New Testament. But there's a practical side of it too, because the same Holy Spirit that guided them in the recording and remembering of truth is also the same Holy Spirit that guides us in our understanding of the truth. He's the one, as it were, that 
illuminates, puts the lights on, gives us a grasp and understanding of the word of God, makes it real to us. And so when the spirit of truth is come, he'll guide you into all truth. You notice it says he shall not speak of himself. Now, we tend to use this, and especially since the advent of the charismatic movement, we tend to use this in this way that he'll not speak of himself. The Holy Spirit's not going to say anything about him. And he's going to speak about the Lord Jesus. And part of the reason what we'll say is, you know, that, that some of our charismatic friends, all they can ever talk about is the spirit, the spirit, the spirit. And yet what the Holy Spirit talks about is Christ. And so it says he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And I want to suggest to you that although that's a nice idea, that's not exactly what this text is say saying. And so let me tell you what I believe this text is saying. Look at chapter 14 for a second. John 14 and verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. In other words, what, what was the Lord Jesus saying I, when he says, I speak not of myself? What he's saying is, I'm speaking the things the Father has given me to say. Okay? So, so not giving my opinions and ideas i'm giving to you what the father has told me to say and here when he shall come he'll not speak of himself in other words he's going to speak that which the father and the lord jesus is giving him to speak that's the idea he's going to communicate those things that have been given to him and so it, it won't be <clears throat> not speak of himself it more literally could say he shall not speak from himself just like the Lord Jesus, the source of truth is really the whole Godhead. The whole Godhead is in view here. So it says, he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he shall show you things to come. So he's going to communicate exactly what the Father and exactly what the Son wants him to communicate. That's what the Spirit is going to reveal. But nevertheless, he is going to speak a lot about the Lord Jesus. We don't, we're not taken away from that because the very next verse says, he shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. Now, again, that takes us back, doesn't it? Uh, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. So what about those many things Jesus had to say to them that they couldn't bear now? Well, it says he shall receive of mine. It was he's going to tell it to the Holy Spirit, and then it says, and shall show it unto you. So they're going to get everything the Lord Jesus intended, but it's going to come to them through the Holy Spirit. And one thing we can say without question is what the Holy Spirit will do is he will glorify Christ. Now, again, we see something here that's quite remarkable in the Godhead. Look at John 17 in verse 4. It says, I have glorified thee on the earth. So the Lord Jesus, he's speaking to his father here, has glorified the father on the earth. Okay. And then verse 5, now, O father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And so... The Lord Jesus glorifies the Father on earth. The Father glorifies the Son in heaven. He glorifies him with the glory he had with him before the world was. Okay, And the Spirit glorifies the Son here on earth. Verse 14, he shall glorify me. And so I just want us to see this. The Father is glorified by the Son. The Son uh, is glorified by the Father in heaven. And the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son here on earth. And so uh, just this ministry of glory that is seen within the Godhead. And I would suggest to you that if our preaching is spirit-filled preaching, it will do what verse 14 says. He shall glorify me. Spirit-filled preaching will glorify the person of the Lord Jesus. It will lift him up. It will exalt him. It will make him look good because I believe that's a good definition of what glory is to make something or someone look good. And so the, 
the spirit-filled man preaching the word of God will exalt and glorify the person of the Lord Jesus. And that is good ministry, ministry that glorifies the Lord Jesus. He shall glorify me. He will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. He shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So it says, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. And so again, the Holy Spirit is going to take of the Lord Jesus the things that he'd like to say to them, but they're not ready for. And he will reveal it to them and he'll take of mine and shall show it unto you. And so we have the wonderful truth of the Holy Spirit revealing these great truths to the disciples, uh, just as the Lord Jesus had said, because he recognized that they just couldn't take it all in at that point. And so verse 16, he says, a little while and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me because I go to the Father. Then said some of the disciples among themselves, what is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, you shall see me. And because I go to the Father. Now, it's kind of interesting that as we look at this little section, since they've left the upper room, remember chapter 14, verse 31 he says at the end of that, arise, let us go hence. And so they've left the upper room, gone out into the cold night air, and they have uh, been on their way towards Gethsemane. Now, as they've been making this journey, the Lord Jesus has done all the talking. When they were in the upper room, remember there was a Q&A session, and we had uh, Thomas and Judas, not Iscariot, asking questions. Peter was asking questions, and it was a it was kind of a, a dialogue going on. But then, since they went out of that upper room up to this moment, the Lord Jesus has been doing all the talking. And now the Lord Jesus makes this statement: "A little while you shall not see me, and again a little while you shall see me, because I go to the Father." And now the disciples are talking, but they're not talking to the Lord Jesus. They're not asking questions of him. They're talking to one another. Then said some of the disciples among themselves, what is this, verse 17, that he says to us a little while. And so now uh, their silence is broken, but it's a discussion amongst themselves, trying to figure out what does he mean by this little while? And of course, it's <laughs> referred to numerous times in this little section. What does he mean a little while? <clears throat> the Lord knew exactly what they wanted to ask. And so he throws some further light on his statement. So again, verse 18, they said, therefore, what is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. So there, as they try and figure out what does he mean by this little while, uh, they're, they're perplexed. They don't know what he's getting at. And so in verse 19, now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him. And said to them, do you inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while, and you shall not see me, and again a little while, and you shall see me. Okay, so he recognizes this is what's been going on, and he, he says, well, you know, is this what you want to ask me? And so in verse 20, he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy so he tells them in explaining this a little while you shall not see me and again a little while you shall see me because i go to the father verse 16 he, he's telling them that preparing them remember all this is preparation and he's letting them know that they're going to go through a great roller coaster emotional event first of all he says you shall not see me because he's going to be taken from them, arrested, and none of them are going to stay with him. And he's going to be taken and put through these trials. And then he's going to be crucified. Then he's going to be put in a cold, empty tomb and they won't see him. And there'll be great sorrow. He says, you shall weep and lament. Great weeping and lamentation at what they see happen to their, the one they followed, the one that they've listen to 
And, and even though he said to them multiple times that I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to rise again the third day. But again, their capacity, they just didn't take it in. Maybe they didn't want to take it in. But, but basically, uh, now he's telling them, that's going to happen. You're not going to see me. And you're going to, the result is there'll be great weeping and lamentation. It, it'll seem to you like the end has come. It will seem so devastating. This amazing journey that you began is going to seem absolutely tragic. But then he says, the world shall rejoice. The world will have its day. The, the, the world will rejoice. We finally got rid of this trouble causer, this one that's exposed us, this one that's revealed our true hearts. We finally got rid of him. And the world will enter into a time of rejoicing. Because we finally put an end to this Jesus of Nazareth. And so the world will rejoice. But just as their weeping and mourning will be short-lived, the world's rejoicing will also be short-lived. Because he says, the world shall rejoice and you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. And he talks to them about that glorious resurrection morning when they, they will see that, yes, he died, but he's risen again. The tomb is empty. He has won the victory over death and the grave and hell. And there it'll just be a time of unmitigated joy in their hearts. It'll turn to rejoicing. And so he's warning them. He's preparing them. And he's saying, if we could put it in our modern uh, kind of English, he's saying, prepare yourself, steal yourselves, because you are going to go through one of the lowest lows, followed by one of the highest highs imaginable. <laughs> You're going to be weeping and mourning, and then your sorrow will be turned to joy. And he likens it to the experience of childbirth. A woman, when she's in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. And, you know, the, the painful experience of bringing a child into the world, the labor pains, the, uh, the, the, the difficulty of it, the, the sweat, the, uh, the, the, the agony, all of this. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And so he's telling them, resurrection morning, just as that child comes out of the womb of the mother, the Lord Jesus is going to come out of a virgin tomb <laughs> and raise, be raised gloriously from the dead, and all the sorrows will quickly be forgotten, and it will be overshadowed by tremendous joy at seeing the Lord Jesus risen from the grave. What joy that will bring to their hearts. And so as the Lord explains this to them, are they uh, just an amazing truth of the emotional roller coaster they're going to go through, the darkness of Calvary, followed by the brilliant, glorious morning of resurrection, the darkness followed by the dawn, as it were, the glorious resurrection morning. Of course, we're going to go through that journey with them, Lord willing, as we get to uh, chapters 19 uh, through 21. And we're going to experience that whole gamut of emotions that they're going to go through. And yet he is preparing them. He's readying them for this experience and trying to get them ready for what they must face. So verse 22, he says, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I'll see you again and your heart shall rejoice and your joy no man can take from you. And to their dying day, they never lost the joy of a risen savior, <laughs> the joy of seeing him risen from the grave. That was a joy that nobody could take from them. Even as they would pay the ultimate price for their faith in him. And yet nobody could rob them for that deep lasting joy of knowing that he was the savior who died, was buried and rose again, victorious the third day. And then he tells them something. That will be a privilege that they will be able to enjoy. He says, in that day, you shall ask me nothing, because he's at the Father's right hand. Verily, I say unto you, 
whatever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. And so one of the privileges that they will be introduced to is this privilege of being able to speak to the Father in his name, in his authority. It's almost as if he himself is the one who is asking. Uh, we're asking it on his authority, the authority of his name. Ask the Father in my name. And it says, you shall receive that your joy may be full. And so they had much sorrow to face. In a little while, you shall not see me. And then a little while you'll see me because I go to the Father. So that sorrow that they were going to endure, well, it'll last for a while, but there would be a different day. A new day is coming. A resurrection morning is coming and a new opportunity to ask the Father in the name of the risen glorious Son. And when we do that, he says that you shall receive that your joy may be full. Sorrow turned to rejoicing. This is what they can expect. But the ride will be an emotional roller coaster. But what a glorious ending it will be for them. The world, yes, they will also have an emotional roller coaster. They'll have great joy. We'll finally rid ourselves of this one. But it will be turned into sorrow because they may have killed him, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again. Hallelujah. What a glorious risen Savior we have. Amen.